Okay, this session is called uh, Real Life Archers, Policing and Domestic Violence. I don't know if you will know why it's called Real Life Archers. Does, does anyone here listen to the archers? Uh, a few people. Okay, I have a, a, a Pavlovian hatred of the archers. Uh, in fact, it, I can genuinely say it is the only piece of music that regardless of where I'm driving, when I could have a coffee in one hand, a cigarette in my mouth, and spinning around a corner, if that music comes on my radio, I have to switch it off immediately. I detest it that much. So the real life archers thing has got nothing to do with me. That was Claire Fox's idea. But of course the significance of it is that there was quite a long, protracted, I understand, uh, discussion about domestic violence. And particularly, which uh, hopefully we'll have some discussion about this, about this new idea of coercive control in terms of something which has become criminal uh, in terms of domestic violence, which we might get on to. My name is Stuart Waiton. I'm a, a lecturer at Aberdeen University, and part of my job is I'm a criminologist. And I think any good criminologist should raise at least one eyebrow when something becomes a police priority. Not that you necessarily have to be completely suspicious of the police, but nevertheless from a basic understanding of how crime statistics, policing, and problematic policing has historically worked, it's often when something becomes a police priority. And in Scotland, domestic violence policing has become a significant police priority. On top of that, Domestic violence policing has also become a political issue of some significance. And as I mentioned, there's changes in the law um, in terms of how we understand uh, this issue. So for me, straight away, that immediately got my interest in terms of what's actually happening here. Even more so was because one of my other interests is football and the policing of language at football. And in Scotland, we'd had a new bill um, making it illegal to be offensive at football. And again, one of the things I found interesting about this was that, especially Celtic and Rangers fans, the old firm, as they're known, were to some extent demonised in terms of they're, they're kind of they're bigoted. You know, these people, especially the Rangers fans, I think. You know, they kind of they wave the Union Jack. What's all that about? They must be bigots. There's a problem. They sing sectarian songs. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we got this new category called Old Firm Domestic Violence. And again, it seemed like a perfect storm. You've got these bigoted, working-class, white, flag-waving football fans. Obviously, they must beat their wives. And you start to get... Uh, this research into to what extent to old firm fans beat their wives. Right, and then people handing out leaflets uh, outside the ground, an announcement made, you know, please don't beat your wife uh, when you go home tonight. Not quite. But nevertheless, uh, John Carnican, who's the head of the Violence Reduction Unit, this ex-chief police officer, uh, and I quote, uh, said, uh, there are, talking about the old firm game, there are 50,000 men there, and the odds are a lot of them will be abusers. That's the ex-chief uh, of police. So, so, so again, I, I, I raise a, a concern about this. On the other hand, domestic violence is something that historically for the last century, you would possibly rightly argue the police didn't give a toss about that if you went to the police and said, I've got problems, my husband's violent, and so on, there's a concern that the police would have done nothing about it. So is there a balance? What should our approach be um, to policing the home? Should it be different to how we police society generally? Is, there, is this a positive move in terms of uh, coercive control? Um, or should we see the family as something special? Uh, and see the rise of policing in relation to this has been uh, problematic. 
that's the framework of the discussion. Uh, our panel today, we've had some, uh, some dropouts uh, from the panel, unfortunately. So it's going to be less confrontational than I hoped, or at least perhaps we'll see. Um, but Polly Neat uh, is unable to make it. And I've just had a, a comment from uh, Annabel Mullen, uh, who's the Liberal Democrat parliamentary spokesperson, uh, who's also had a dropout because uh, of a, a child uh, illness, unfortunately. Nevertheless, uh, we've got three uh, very good panellists, I hope. We've got Nick Smithers on my right, who's now an independent social worker, former National Development <coughs> Officer for Abused Men in Scotland. We've got Gemma Fox, uh, who's the Managing Director of the North Wales Women's Centre. And we've got Katazina or Cassia Prusak, who's a postgraduate student at my University of Ate, researching policing domestic violence in Scotland. Okay, without any further ado, in that order, Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. So, the recent domestic abuse storyline that you've heard about um, in the soap, soap opera, The Archers, so it is a soap opera, if you remember, has caused a quite a stir, hence why we're talking about it. <coughs> in the broadsheets and online, and it triggered a crowdfund for a fictional character which has raised £170,000. Now, I don't know if people here are going to remember, but this whole scenario reminded me of the Free Deirdre Barlow campaign in the late 90s. I don't know if anyone remembers this. It was in Coronation Street. And uh, Deirdre Barlow was um, locked up unfairly. And if anyone does remember, the campaign itself reached the Houses of Parliament and Tony Blair, no less, instructed Home Secretary Straw to comment on this and to investigate. And it's perhaps striking that both these storylines involve women apparently facing injustice. And for me, this somehow taps into some societal angst, which other storylines do not. A recent Coronation Street storyline featured a man called Tyrone, who was a victim of domestic abuse. And while this resulted in a large spike in calls to the Mankind Initiative, which is a helpline for male victims, um, it didn't go much further than that. Um, and I think perhaps it was just too counterintuitive to trigger the do something response that Helen or Deirdre's apparent helplessness seemed to. Now this storyline in The Archers was written under the guidance of Women's Aid and Refuge and it describes a pattern of controlling behaviour which is known as coercive control in, in, amongst people working in domestic abuse as was coined by Professor Evan Stark of Rutgers University in his book of the same name. His book contains similarly lurid and melodramatic examples of such relationships which are characterised by a pattern of abuse which eventually bring one person completely under the control of the other. Now, actually, in, in some cases this will lead to violent death and extreme um, examples of abuse, as, as we know. So Stark himself, though, is clear that it's not one person under the control of the other, it is women under the control of men, uniquely. The book is a treatise of patriarchy theory, really, and Stark dismisses the possibility out of hand that women might exert such abuse over men, or that men or women in same-sex relationships might be similarly abusive to each other. The new domestic abuse law in place in England and Wales since December 2015 has not yielded many convictions. And the elements of the legal establishment who raised questions about the sense or usefulness of such a law will not be surprised by this. The lack of prosecutions, however, will disappoint activists for whom prosecutions are very much desired. For while the law covers acts which were already illegal, they are now brought together in this new domestic abuse law ostensibly to send a message. For the activists believe that domestic abuse is perpetrated by men driven by a sense of privilege. Stark's stories, like the Archer story, 
rely on a view of domestic abuse characterised, I believe, by outdated gender stereotypes. Men are conditioned to control and women are conditioned to be controlled. In the world of Stark et al, domestic abuse is the cause and consequence of gender inequality. No evidence is required for this. In fact, the CEO of Scottish Women's Aid proclaimed at a Scottish Government event last year that there was too much e emphasis on evidence. Now, while I understand that some evidence can be of questionable rigour, I found this a surprising suggestion. The pursuit of the message and the reliance on the police and courts to enforce it has unintended consequences. In Scotland, eradication of domestic abuse, as we've heard, has been a priority of Police Scotland for a few years, mostly under the auspice of Sir Stephen House, who I believe was well known in London before. And I heard recently from Lord Carloway, who is the head of Scotland's judiciary, that Scotland now has a contradictory situation of one of the lowest levels of crime in Europe, but simultaneously one of the highest rates of men in prison on short-term sentences. We are competing with developing countries such as Belarusia for this honour. So this, to me, is hardly progressive. And worse, it doesn't work. The stated aim of the government to protect women and girls with their policies does no such thing as it is based on a misguided first principle. There's a plethora of solid research and practice, I believe, which is developing and opening up greater opportunities to effectively intervene and help families in adversity. But the service sector is flooded with organisations which must first prove that they adhere to the gendered analysis of domestic abuse before they can get any of the approximate 20 million currently given out each year in Scotland. This is just in Scotland, of course. Furthermore, if anyone wants to work for these organisations, you must demonstrate knowledge and understanding when you apply of the gendered analysis to get even to get an interview. The courts are overrun with cases which should not, many should not be anywhere near courts, while the prisons are full of young men who most likely are troubled by adverse childhood experience and trauma as their partners on the outside waiting for them are. And so the cycle continues. The chances of receiving effective intervention, which recognises trauma as a primary causal factor, is slim in a service landscape looking to soap opera tropes for a defining narrative. What we now have is a dominant activist lobby dictating government policy, leading to an increasingly authoritarian state which fails at its primary objective. Okay. Thank you. Gemma. Firstly, I need to explain what our organisation does and the context of my perspective. And I know um, Stuart mentioned, but just to, to make it uh, clear that um, I don't represent Women's Aid. Um, our Women's Centre is just that. It's a community centre for women providing support and social activities. Uh, we actually started out as an IT training centre for women. But as we delivered services <clears throat> in one of the most deprived wards in Wales, our women presented with multiple and complex issues and domestic abuse was a key problem. Our organisation is dedicated to empowering women to economic independence and to move them on from trauma um, that is or may have been in their lives. I believe strongly that labelling people as victims does not help them to do this. So we aim to deliver our services discreetly when it comes to domestic violence and encourage them to move on rather than to fly the flag as a survivor. We do uh, deliver a special service to both women and men who are victims of domestic abuse. Their stories are a traumatic read. Systematic and relentless <coughs> disempowerment of a human being with immense cruelty perpetrated against them. The damage to children who are witnesses to this abuse is also well documented. 
and the cost of the fallout to society is in the millions each year. We all know the uh, sadly familiar statistic that on average, uh, I'm going to say, two women will be murdered by their partner or ex-partner per week in the UK. Whilst I accept that domestic violence can affect any creed, colour, age, gender or social status, women in poverty are disproportionately affected by domestic uh, abuse. Women who have suffered domestic abuse are also disproportion disproportionately represented in prison, as I actually agree are men, uh, and it is a known causal factor for offending behaviour. It is part of a package of spiralling problems which end in prison for many. Working in one of the most deprived wards in Wales, we work with these cases and the results are deeply disturbing. As a society, surely we owe it to each other and to ensure that people are protected from harm and to intervene early to minimise damage to families. Whilst I do understand the public nervousness around police seemingly having more access to interfere in our lives with the new law, I don't find this to be the case in our reality of working with both police and cases of domestic abuse. For one thing, the police just don't have the capacity to interfere, even if they felt it necessary to do. We do meet Helen Titchener-type cases, uh, referring to the Archers case here, um, of those who are accused of violence against their partners. But mainly we have met these cases more as offenders in the criminal justice system and not as a person referred to uh, for support. As I listened to the trial, I found myself thinking uh, cynically about the consultation that probably took place to ensure that the new law was highlighted in some way. The Archers did a good job of building the story over many months reflecting real life cases and how the control increases. We all heard the slow and painful deconstruction of Helen's identity and were all appalled by this. More often than not, women who are in controlling relationships would not acknowledge it, as Helen wouldn't. Identification or disclosure often occurs due to an, other issues that an agency or a family member picks up or discovers, such as debt problems, offender management, non-attendance of appointments, or families concerned that they're not allowed to be in touch with their loved one. Is it interfering for an agency to intervene if they see a person suffering and know that the signs are pointing to a significant risk of harm? Surely it is only right that the law recognise that this is unacceptable behaviour for another human being to inflict on another. I believe that we're not policing the family with the new laws but merely helping the legal case for conviction by ensuring that coercive control elements are considered alongside the physical harm element. The two are more often than not linked, and knowledge of coercive behaviour can be a warning sign for others to provide support, particularly to those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Josh. So, yeah, as Tara mentioned um, already, I'm doing a research project on policing domestic violence in Scotland specifically, and uh, there are some differences. We do not have a crime of controlling and coercive behaviour as yet in Scotland, but there are plans to introduce it, and the consultation already carried out by the Scottish Government and the proposed draft offence uh, of domestic abuse is based on the concept of controlling and coercive behaviour. Also, the official definition used in Scotland already in includes psychological, emotional and financial abuse. So it seems that it's just a matter of time before it becomes law. This inclusion of non-physical um, acts and the widening of the definition of domestic abuse, therefore, seems to be a general trend. And in both Scotland and England, it's being done as part of this wide, wider governmental strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women. So despite all the declarations that they do not discriminate against um, male victims or um, LGBT um, people, it is considered and treated as a gendered issue and largely influenced by feminist ideology. And this is the part I examine in my research, the influence of ideology and pressure groups on policy and practice. The way this, uh, this issue is being defined and framed by those groups. Um, and in terms of um, Ivan Stark's theory of controlling coercive behaviour, some argue 
that it was developed to re-energize this tall domestic violence revolution by providing us with a conceptual model to emphasize why co coercive control is gendered and that it was a response to the criticism of the patriarchal society theory and the discovered gender symmetry in terms of the use of violence within relationships. So in other words, in light of the findings from all the research on men, lesbian and, and gay victims that contradicts the theory that domestic abuse is large, what, largely what men do to women, some feminists then started saying that it's not the violence that's the, mon, uh, that's the main problem, it's the male control and domination. So this reframing of the issue to retain the focus on women is crucial as it enables the women's movement to continue claiming ownership of it and to protect this concept of being an exclusive victim on which their ideology is based. And when we have a policy based on ideology rather than facts, we end up with, with a situation in which police officers charged with implementing that policy have to apply those extremely abstract theoretical concepts like intimate terrorism to messy everyday situations that do not fit neatly into those imposed categories. What's more, I find this extension of the definition to cover non-physical acts that have not previously been considered criminal very troubling and, and problematic for a number of reasons. And due to time constraint, I'm just going to briefly state uh, those reasons and hopefully we can discuss them together in more detail later on. So, first of all, um, I do find it extremely intrusive. It's entering the realm of policy thoughts and words and the state is invited to regulate our personal relationships and to set the standard of how we should relate to those close to us. And I agree with, those, uh, with the concern, concerns often raised by the critics of this law that too broad a definition of domestic abuse that not only includes non-physical acts but makes them the main focus encourages the pathologization of behaviors that are part and parcel of intimate relationships. So while, his, while historically it was the protection of, of individuals from the power of the state that was understood to be the main goal of a liberal society, today's public increasingly seeks and is encouraged to seek protection by the state, which results in state's intrusiveness in more and more areas of life and, and in what some call the micromanagement of behavior. Exemplified by other developments in law, uh, like the name person scheme in Scotland, or what um, Stuart mentioned, the Offensive Behaviour of Football and Threatening Communication Scotland Act. So the heavy-handed approach to policing domestic abuse should arguably put into this wider political and social context, and seen as yet another example of the display of the so-called penal populism and hyper-regulation of public and private sphere that is characteristic of politics in general nowadays. Secondly, as some critics pointed out, protection by definition also involves control, and this approach is indeed very patronizing, especially towards women, disempowering victims, denying, denying them their agency and ability to decide for themselves, often putting victims off contacting the police again. Criminal law should be the last resort. It's a quick fix, often criticized as an inflexible, one-size-fits-all approach, and what I've learned from my research and interviews with police officers is that there is this official script that everyone uses to praise the new approach to policy and domestic abuse. But off the record, they say that it's a complete disaster in terms of its practical application and unintended consequences. They claim that there is this climate of fear when they, can, when they cannot discuss it or criticize it. And with regards to pro-arrest policies, the fear of being criticized for not making the right decision. So even though there is no such thing as mandatory arrest policy in Scotland, the pressure from the above is so huge that police officers are scared to use their personal judgment and common sense and instead decide to detain or arrest suspects virtually in every single case just to cover their backs. And this has serious consequences. The rights of suspects and defendants are being sacrificed in order to reassure the general public that is increasingly seen as being vulnerable. The pro-arrest policy results in cases of illegitimate detention and the recent extension of the category of vulnerable witnesses in Scotland, for example, to include inter alia witnesses uh, in domestic abuse cases, undermines the right to face one's accuser and to confront, to confront them by cross-examination that is a crucial safeguard against malicious allegations and should be fiercely defended given the fact that false allegations of domestic or sexual abuse can be extremely damaging to one's reputation and are rarely being prosecuted. 
So um, just to demonstrate the kind, of, the, the kind of criticism and the concern voiced by, by police officers in the interviews, I'm going to say a few quotes. I still have time. Yeah. So one of them said, the first question of a domestic incident is, why wasn't he detained? It's also, it's all sort of, everybody is so scared of getting into trouble or getting criticized from the higher ranks. Another person said that there are many minor incidents and there are times when we have people who should not be in ourselves. Decent people are vulnerable people, but by the letter of the law, they must be detained, charged, and what you have, it shouldn't be happening. Um, one police officer said that, do we wish to live under a di dictatorial legal system? or one where there is the ability for those attending to base their decisions on experience, circumstances, evidence available. Um, one of them said that overall it's been a good change when, um, when we're dealing with serious incidents, but in terms of the non-serious incidents, which make up most of our domestic type things, it's been a disaster, an absolute disaster. Our workload to deal with even the most simple domestic incidents has gone from minimal to maximum, a lot of work involved. Secondly, it's put a lot of people off contacting us. One of them said that uh, if we could go back to having our judgment trusted, it would help a lot. We wouldn't go into a lot of time as domestic somebody needs to go to that. We like we don't really want to go to that. It would take a lot of that away, a lot of the dread we're dealing with it. Just two more. Um, one of them when discussing the vulnerable persons register in Scotland said that your general domestic victims are totally lost in this database. Everyone is considered a vulnerable person. Every tiny little incident is considered a, a domestic incident if it's involving people that are in a relationship or who have been in a relationship. When well, that's not necessarily the case. And the last one, it doesn't matter. You could just be having an argument and it can result in the end being in, in the jail. So it's massively intrusive on people's lives, definitely. Okay, thank you. Could we give a round of applause for the speakers? <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll be quite keen. I'm going to ask each of the speakers a question myself first, but I'm going to throw out a question for the audience. I'm interested to know if you think that coercive control is a good law, because clearly there will be some relationships where you have uh, uh, partners who are emotionally abusive and seriously emotionally abusive. In which case, should we just sit back and do nothing? Or should we do something? So I'd be interested to know uh, what you think. I'll just ask each of the speakers a question. Nick, you argued that there's an, a gendered approach to domestic abuse. Right? Now, I would try and counter that by saying, well, what do you mean? Could you elaborate? And is it the case with policing and law? Because as far as I understand it, in law, it's not gendered. If a woman does something to a guy and vice versa, at least legally and arguably in policing terms, there isn't a gendered approach. Or is there? And if not, what do you mean? Well, the, no, the police actually are one of the best in this sense, I think. That so the figures for uh, male victims, for example, have doubled in 10 years in Scotland. Um, so I don't particularly... The, the point about the gendered approach, the gendered analysis, is the policy. And when I, I gave evidence to the Justice Committee on this in Scotland in December, and really for me it was, from the perspective of male victims and the, their marginalisation, um, the point is that the law, it didn't really make, it's not going to make the slightest bit of difference because of the policy in Scotland is called equally safe and it's the prevention of violence against women and girls. So it's actually also to remove boys from the policy. Um, and from that, and that's what I was getting at there, the funding, so there's 20 million attached to the policy, so this translates into real services. So not for the police, but for all the support services for um, in Scotland and through local authorities. There's, uh, you have to, I, I looked at the, um, the application for that, the, and then for job applications linked to it, and you have to 
agreed to this gendered analysis, which is the, um, how you understand it in the sense that domestic abuse is about structural gender inequality in society. So how this then manifests on the ground for men is, and all this funding goes out, pushes a narrative that domestic abuse is something that men do to women. It's the public story of domestic abuse. So one man, in fact, I interviewed a male victim who was a victim of attempted murder, and he mentioned the archers as an example of any feeling of complete alienation when he was trying to look for help. And that's, you know, so it, that's the picture. That's, it, these men aren't going to ask, going to phone the police. Men actually who are in these coercively controlling relationships wouldn't think of it as domestic abuse. It's such a powerful narrative, I think, that's yeah. so, reinforced. <clears throat> so you're, you're questioning this idea that women are in a framework where the, the, the society we live in is entirely dominated by male patriarchy. Mm. So how would you describe what domestic abuse is then? If it's um, not that, what is it? Well, domestic abuse for me and from my experience of dealing with it is inevitably... There are cases like of course of control without any doubt of this sort of um, stereotypical almost male patriarch. That does happen but the majority of domestic abuse cases, the case, I mean, as working as I am at the moment, as a social worker, I've seen it, you're dealing with a shambles, a mess, a complex of problems of potentially drug addiction, alcoholism, mental health problems, um, adverse childhood experience, all things intersecting. Um, that when it comes to the gendered issue, there is, gender is vitally important. Of course it is in our society, in our lives, but the way it's portrayed in this very sort of unicausal and simplistic analysis that doesn't even come close to doing the job. So there's there's issues for men in terms of, for example, it's been argued that there's the chivalric principle. So men are brought up with an inhibition to hit women, whereas actually the same doesn't apply to women. So within relationships, men who are victims will be inhibited from who are from a violent partner potentially, um, and from telling anyone about it through shame and all these kind of things. But when men who are violent to their partners and controlling may also be likely to be violent people in the community as well and elsewhere in their lives, so much more than women would be. So the point being, there's a huge complex issue that requires to be investigated and should be the bedrock of the um, policy and approach, we should most certainly be looking at the whole picture, the best evidence we can get our hands on, the, the, you know, to get a proper understanding, to inform policing, to look at, so for, um, so when the police do intervene, what happens next, because at the moment the point of the, the court's been filled up is because of this mandatory arrest type of policy and then the Crown Office had the same uh, policy dictated, and this was coming from my perspective, directly from women's aid to the government, to the, the Crown Office. Yeah, I'll stop you there. Right, right we'll come back to the mandatory arrest thing, because I do think it's quite um, important. Uh, so you can bear that in mind. Gemma, you said intervening earlier, this is, the police are moving into this direction. Could you elaborate on what you mean by that? And because uh, immediately it raises concern in my mind about, well, who chooses that and is... I'm actually not saying the... Sorry, yeah. Um, I'm not actually saying the police intervene earlier. I'm saying agencies who can maybe work with uh, the families. Um, I would advocate very strongly that um, people who are in abusive relationships have choices and we would advocate that they have as much information as you know as they can be given about what their choices are and if they choose to remain then that is their choice um, but I still feel that uh, again I can only talk about you know obviously the, our work in North Wales um, and our specific work I don't have a wider knowledge. I think I heard you right um, but her, her, she's using a, a social constructionist approach in terms of trying to understand how a social problem has been created and the way we understand it today. 
you're arguing, at least in part, I think, that the reason that we've shifted towards this discussion about coercive control is because the feminist argument that it's only men who are violent towards women was questioned and, and challenged. And by moving towards coercive control, you were able to revitalize this idea of men as being powerful and domineering in it, their narrative. Could you, I don't know if the, you can elaborate yeah. on that at all, but I thought that was interesting. That's correct. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so yeah, there have been um, many studies done, um, some say like 200 studies, about um, violence in relationships and that uh, largely there are the statistics that it's usually 50-50 in terms of use of violence. So women, um, they, they claim that women are as, can be as violent as men and sometimes even more violent. Um, so yeah, um, and, and the gender analysis, um, it, it excludes um, male victims, excludes lesbians. How would you explain violence in a lesbian relationship using the patriarchal um, theory? So you have all those contradictions that you know, the feminists have to deal with and sometimes they just basically ignore that. In terms of like what um, Nick was saying, in terms of causes um, of violence as well, there's just this simplistic explanation that there's just this unilateral cause, and the, and and they don't take into account account psychological issues, um, class analysis as well. It's all treated as excuses for my violence, basically. Okay. Thank you. Right. Over to you, lot. Any points or questions? Um, firstly, I find it encouraging that there are so many men here. Um, so I, I noticed that, and it's wonderful. Um, and probably partly because the topic was uh, listed as quite sort of gender neutral. Um, I, I feel as if I've been living through the episode of the Archers myself, uh, but role reversed. Um, and I have to say, without thankfully a potential murder. Um, so I've been through the family court process over the last four years, and I'm still going through it. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I feel totally identified with the Archer's theme, um, massively. I've been helped recently by reading a book by Dr. Childress. Um, and in it, the book is basically about narcissism and borderline personality disorder, which has helped me for the first time in 10 years to understand a bit about what's going on between me and my ex-wife and my, my son. Um, one theory I want to propose is that abuse I, I think is equal between men and women, but I think my theory is that men are more likely to inflict physical abuse on women, but women are incredibly better at words on the whole than us men are, and I think they're incredibly good at inflicting psychological abuse on us men, which then potentially drives us men to physically abuse women, so it's a horrible cycle. And there are just two um, points I want to finish on, um, I, and they're, they're dilemmas and maybe potential solutions. Having spent the last four years in the family court, I have been absolutely horrified, frustrated, and I don't want to about it, that the family court system in this country is so biased towards women. Um, so whatever my ex-wife says is believed, whatever I say is not believed, or it's taken on a totally different slant. And I'm, I'm horrified by that incredible bias. And the second point, and I don't know what we do about that, the second point is that I, we somehow need more expertise, because now I've discovered what I think my ex-wife, what the condition is, and the implications that has for my son. The problem is nobody will believe it. Nobody believes it. So we somehow need more expertise. My son was assessed a year ago by an independent social welfare guy, and even though I pointed out certain things, uh, my evidence was ignored, and things were glossed over. Things my son said were taken totally superficially with nothing deeper. So I'd love, we need the police and the judges, they're not qualified. We somehow need to get training in with professional experts, not social welfare people, but people with true understanding and professional knowledge. Okay. I don't know how we do that. Okay. I haven't seen the archers, but I'm trying to uh, follow the discussion from a theoretical perspective. I understand that uh, 
well also from what I learned and what I see that there is some cultural as aspects also to domestic violence and domestic abuse. Um, especially to Karsha was my question because at some point when you were uh, describing uh, kind of like the behavior of police officers towards the implementation of this new law, uh, you were saying that they felt kind of like uncomfortable or that they couldn't kind of like land what the theory said and in the, like in the, in the practical day-to-day -day life. But in this way, do you think that it will also mean that then maybe they just need more training regarding this? Because we are also talking about something that soci sociological theories, etc., that go uh, to practical daily basis. And then in this sense, also the law is kind of like Net, like we like when you talk about the law, you, tr you try to talk about tangibles, you know. Like lawyers kind of try to uh, operationalize and def define everything in terms that you can measure them in the physical world. So it's hard to talk about things like well, uh, emotional coercion or things like that. You have to kind of like take uh, evidence, disperse evidence, and try to uh, make a rational framework framework of what this means. So I was just wondering, in, in this case in particular, because maybe like the police officers' uh, attitude is also because they haven't received the, the proper training. And then the, in general, when you kind of like try to implement something that is new and something that it's, well, you, you might get some resistance in that sense. Like people always did, uh, have, have their habits, etc. So they want to continue like proceeding as they, all, that they always did. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on it. It's been mentioned a couple of times before. Um, something I didn't know was that it's roughly equal gender-wise as to domestic um, abuse and violence. But do you think part of the reason that we don't, we automatically think of women being abused is because we're not actually educated about it? So in schools, we're not taught about types of abuse that there are, so our, obviously physical is the main one that comes to mind, but we're not taught about the emotional and mental um, parts of it. And my second point was that, do we feel it's once again been touched on, but do you feel that it's maybe women are empathised with more because it's seen as a, a social norm as such? That it, that it is women that are abused that's more recognised as such? So is it that they're given a sympathy card and empathised with more? Kerry Dingle from the Education Charity World Rights Citizen TV Station World Bites. Some quick questions. Firstly, isn't it legitimate, historically at least, to understand domestic violence and domestic abuse <coughs> as a real product of the second class position of women? reflected in how women were thus treated. Now, in my view, that's pretty much long gone in terms of women's position today. And therefore, I have a lot of sympathy with the idea that that explanation doesn't really hold. And that's not to say there isn't any domestic abuse, but I also have a problem with the, oh, I've been left out. Because there does seem to be a fair amount of this whinging. Well, <clears throat> you know, men are also abused, homosexuals, abuse in relationship, uh, uh, violence in lesbian in relationships, it really feels and sounds a lot like you've counted us out, we're not being included, me, me, me. And I find that really problematic because I would argue, and I'm not a statistician or a criminologist, but from pure anecdotal and everyday evidence of everyone I work with, that there is far less violence within the family than ever before and far more of an obsession with it. And surely we have to do, as well as a broadening, as you've alluded to and the panel is addressing, of what constitutes domestic abuse. And it seems to me that there's a bit of a, uh, a consensus on the, on the platform or so far that the issue here is men and women not being included in the analysis. I'd say it's a big deal. You know, why are we obsessing on this when it's less of a problem, actually, and what, why on earth would we want, even if the police are far softer and less problematic than they have been in enforcing unequal law historically, why would we want greater police intervention in anybody's lives? We live in profoundly anti-human times, and surely, and all those support services 
very sympathetic to, it's absolutely necessary. Why would we want anybody criminalised for having a crap relationship? And how does that help anybody? Is um, a parent blocking access and contact with someone's children uh, considered to be an act of coercive control under the new laws? I think that throughout history there's been a lot of stigma around men's domestic violence issues that are more caused by other men than they are women. From my personal experiences, I've seen men make jokes about other men who have got, gotten raped. Like, um, there was an incident a few months back where a school teacher raped a 13-year-old boy, and there were people laughing at it, saying that, oh, at least he got laid at 13. And I think that men's regards to domestic violence against other men comes from this idea that we've always had about masculinity in society and that men are not vulnerable at all and that's partly the reason why we see men come forward about domestic violence a lot less because they're scared of getting pressure from other men and they're scared of being humiliated. That's very interesting. I, I'm just I'm going to throw a few of my prejudices here and you can please... Because I wonder sometimes about this thing about um, men not being open to support and things like that. And it seems a curious thing to me, that because I think there's some truth to that. But on the other hand, these kind of norms of what it means to be a man have, are associated with being strong. Right? And I think that's quite a good thing. Right? I don't think it's a good thing if it means that you're too one-dimensionally unable to talk about anything or whatever. But nevertheless, is it not good to have norms in society that expect strength? Because at the minute, we seem to be encouraging norms where you don't have strength. But having said that, I still recognise the question you're raising. Nick? I didn't get your name, but is it Hayden? Kerry. Kerry. Yeah, I wanted to come back to what you were saying. I thought it was... It, resonated with me very strongly. Now, what you might, like, I've worked for abused men in Scotland for, you know, and the, the survivors, victims, and like, the, the notion that of creating a new class of victims in, in some sort of sense of, uh, well, what about us? And that sort of what about it? And that often comes up in terms of gender, political debates online did make me very uh, uncomfortable and now that the funding was stopped and I'm free I can sort of, it, 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 I think, well, we, and also I played into that because I felt I had to in doing that job. We got the money and I thought, well, if they're saying, even the coercive control um, law, I was, I thought this is crazy and I went and gave, but I went and, I went and then represented the organisation after a discussion and gave evidence, which I didn't I particularly personally agree with. To say, well, yeah, we should do this. Yeah, we, you know, because I thought if you don't do that, we'll be pariahs and we've got nothing as it is. And there are male victims who there are literally no services. There's not a single penny spent, not one penny for a male-specific service from the government or local authority out of the the millions. So it is a, there is an issue for men who are in that. I think, okay, but there has been an on a sort of building wave that this is um, tip of the iceberg, all this kind of um, rhetoric is just accepted and it grows and it grows and then we get more and more and more you know, intrusion and frankly, certainly in terms of the police uh, in, in domestic abuse cases, I'm working, I've just gone from that job to work in social work practice and, and as child and family because I was made redundant in there and then suddenly I'm seeing again that we, we came up with a phrase, me and my colleague, for most of what we were doing, which was shite for shite. And I'll explain that, that um, we were doing shite for shite that was coming in. And in terms of most of what we were getting coming in as a social worker is pretty irrelevant, but it's generated by police going out and having to do all these things. Then we have to go out and, we, and from any one thing that comes in, it generates hours of work and it's mainly pointless. So this is part of the 
this process, I think, that you're describing. So there's a bit of a balance. I do think men need specific services proportionally. It's just there are men, you know, the, the, who are who, who need it, and there should be something. But it's there's a, a, a lot of nonsense, and there's a grave danger of going down that road, which I think I fell into, and that many people are. Okay. Just to add to that, um, the element of work that we deliver at the North Wales Women's Centre is um, something that some of you will recognise as the Independent Domestic Violence Service, um, which is actually an accredited um, and recognised training that somebody would have to have to have received before they can deliver this. And we deliver this for the county of Denbyshire. And across North Wales, there are different organisations delivering this service in each county. Um, the, the whole premise of this service is that it's independent and you wouldn't, get to, you wouldn't be able to tender unless you were delivering to all groups, which is why it's the only piece of work that we do uh, that is actually uh, for um, every gender. Um, so Wales, I think, uh, certainly in Wales, it is, it is recognised that it isn't gender specific. Um, having said that, obviously we're the North Wales Women's Centre, so we end up getting most referrals for, for women. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make that point really. Um, I, I do feel, um, coming back to somebody else's point, um, and I know Cassia and I discussed this just before we came on, that um, I know you might think this is mad because I'm the North Wales Women's Centre, but I actually agree wholeheartedly that the feminist ideology is, is a huge problem around this service. I understand where it's come from and why and the history of the suffragettes and, and everything that goes with women's inequality in the past. And I wish in some ways that you could almost scrub it and start again because the power of these groups to um, affect policy is, is quite scary. Um, in Wales, um, they removed the, uh, the men and boys from the Act as well, uh, for that reason. Um, and everyone's too frightened to, to speak out. Certainly the policy makers are too frightened to actually say that it's not about women and girls. I think, sorry, that it is about women and girls. So I, I just think it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I really honestly do not see a way around it. Uh, victimhood is the latest uh, big phrase, um, and it's so frustrating. You can, I mean, I spoke to a minister who looks after this in Wales only a couple of weeks ago and tried to explain to him that I found it very frightening that victimhood is the be all and end all as far as their funding is concerned, <coughs> and that they are so concerned in having um, the flag flying for their funding streams that they miss the point of what we're trying to do, which is help people to move on and live useful lives and happy lives. Okay, before I bring Cassie in, um, I, again, th throw this out to the audience in terms of your opinion. Should the family be seen differently in terms of policing? Because my instinct is to think yes. And my instinct in terms of coercive control which this is this isn't the government's, but this is how domestic violence charities are describing Ellen Stanser, the man in the red tops question, why he checks the football results. Um, Sunderland lost, by the way, 94th minute. So never mind. We'll not go there. Uh, so it's uh, domestic violence charities have classified emotional abuse as yelling, name calling, blaming and shaming, mocking, laughing at someone in front of others. Um, and also have argued that people may not even know that it's happening to them. Um, so that's interesting in terms of the, to, what, to what extent that will uh, uh, be part of the educational package for the police in terms of um, uh, uh, their approach. And I, I raise this partly because I think the thing I'm most concerned about at, at a sort of wider cultural level is the extent to which being a, an adult and being a kind of a, a human subject, if you like, at the most basic level, must be about our capacity to make choices for ourselves and take responsibility. And I would have thought our relationships and our personal relationships and how we deal with them must be a fundamental aspect of that. 
And we seem to be losing that to a certain extent by this expansion of the idea of police action in particular in relation to the family. But anyway, I'll just throw that out if you, people have any thoughts on that. Cassie, anything? Okay, um, Anker's um, question is, so yeah, I agree with you that reducing the, the debate to who's a bigger victim is not helpful and I would encourage um, you know, aspiring um, victim status, um, this kind of thing. But I think um, my point was that excluding men is one result of you know, the, uh, the feminist ideology. Um, and another result is the fact that they are the people, they are the pressure group after years of campaigning. I mean, they've done a great job. They brought the issue of domestic abuse to the fore, um, public um, attention. Um, but after years of campaigning, they became sort of um, what you call it, um, insider claims makers with huge influence over policy and decisions, you know, policy decisions. Um, and the, the, the way they frame the, the problem, the issue, the language they use, this melodramatic language, the examples, so they use extreme examples as um, saying that this are, this is the, these are the typical examples of domestic abuse. But they're far from typical, but that, that's the whole idea. They, there is this, um, in terms of um, social constructionism, especially um, Noel Best theory, is that um, there is this um, competition in the social market, uh, social problems marketplace? So they, they have to compete with other social problems, with other campaigners who try to raise awareness of their issues. So that's why um, we hear about extreme cases. There is this use of um, um, this sensational narrative. And the terminology like um, patriarchal terrorism or the idea of domestic violence survivor. So, um, yeah, that's what Gemma was saying. That's, that's quite problematic and encourages people to identify or even to, uh, you know, to embrace the victim persona. Oh, stop. Right. I'll go back out. You can come back. Well, I'll, I'll come back to you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the gentleman over there for sharing his experiences and I would agree entirely that what we're looking at is not necessarily a police issue, but it is something that we need to get to grips with and I don't think people have, that we're talking about a pathological relationship. And when you're in a pathological relationship, um, intellectual rationality has has absolutely no uh, input into that. Um, my own experience is that I'm a strong woman, I've got a degree in law, a degree in psychology, I've been in international business, and I think it's really important that, um, that this can happen to anyone, not just somebody who's poor and vulnerable. The first question really is, do you think it's the case that uh, the working, working class communities used to deal with these issues themselves in the past and now the state and the police are more the people called upon? When I was young, I remember picking up a, a milk bottle and putting it through the teeth of the, the guy who battered my sister. And I know that's not the right thing to do, but often that's... <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty though, it's different levels are on the spectrum. Working class communities used to deal with these things, but perhaps the fragmentation, the collapse of communities is the reason why the state agencies and police are coming in. The, the second thing is, it's a given, when Gemma talks about her, um, her sort of uh, aid refuge, it's a given, of course, that uh, women get battered. It's a given, and it's absolutely brilliant, the work that Gemma does and all women's refugees and agencies do, because that's an absolute given. Um, the, the question um, that I'm really interested in is sort of linked, it's the demonization of men. Is that going on in society? I'm a Celtic supporter, and I can't help noticing in Scotland the way Celtic and Rangers fans have been labelled as beating their wives after Celtic and Rangers games, and there's no evidence for that, and it's been pointed out, but it still pops up constantly in the media. And why is that, question mark? But the last thing, the most important thing I want to ask is to Nick and Gemma. It's about coercive control, because I want to just nail this. I absolutely don't think coercive control has got anything to do with the police or the law, or anyone. Am I wrong? To me, 
you have to fight and defend the model of a human being. And if that human being is in a relationship where they're taking shit from their partner and their partner's a wanker, don't we have to at some point just say we have to leave them to have the courage to leave that relationship uh, rather than put up that shit? Now that might sound cold and tell me if I'm being really stupid for saying that because I really in my gut don't want to have to accept this term because it takes us down a very slippery slope and I think it makes things worse. My first point is my personal opinion and my second point will be talking about this from a project I'm working on with Erin Pizzi. Um, some of you might have heard of her, I'll tell you a little bit in a second. Um, my first point is I totally agree with this gentleman that um, coercive control should not be handled by the police. I think we should be uh, trying to uh, promote uh, ways of personal relationships where people can express themselves freely and they can be emotionally healthy with each other. Um, and that's about codependent and dependent relationships and uh, healing from trauma, all those lovely things within kind of therapy that people might do, but they don't necessarily need to go to therapy to do that. Um, now, I've spoken to a police officer recently who works in Croydon, um, who was telling me that her workload is mainly mental health and domestic violence. She spends 80, 90% of her time dealing with those kinds of cases because of the targets that she's been given and not dealing with other types of crime which you would associate the police to be handling. Um, and I just think that represents, that little anecdote represents exactly what we're doing by making this stuff into law. Um, my second point is that I'm working with Erin uh, Pizzi to set up a foundation um, because she was the lady who first started the domestic violence uh, shelters, which is now Refuge in the UK in, in the 1970s. Um, she didn't have the greatest relationship with the feminists back then, um, and that's a story for another time. However, um, we are working on a programme where we would uh, have um, shelters which are there to help people who are... Um, I don't really want to use the word victim, but for lack of a better word, victims of domestic violence, whether they are male or female, and it will be gender neutral. Okay, um, sorry. Um, and one of the things that she always points out, and it can be controversial, um, is that uh, Women's Aid manages to get lots of funding from the government and various other sources, and uh, most of it does not go to any of the refuges. Okay, okay. Um, so that's just one thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Sorry. Is it not the case that a lot of this law has come from politicians thinking that they can do everything and not realising that if they make some things better, they'll make some things worse? And this is one of the typical examples where they're making, on the whole, the situation worse by intervening. Um, I've been doing some work with local authorities, with police, probation, and various other local services to improve their, um, well, to review what they're doing around domestic abuse. And two things have struck me while I've been doing that in the research in the area. One is that it, those agencies often don't do that very well. They, 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 they don't work with um, victims of domestic abuse in a particularly good way. That it's not causing it right. The assessments are very bad. But a lot of bad practice happens around the country. But as some of the panel have already said, there's a real problem when a, a whole different agenda is used, um, which is highly, highly ideological. Um, overstates the, the problem in terms of its uh, how much of it is going on, and it, it doesn't actually help. It, it, it doesn't solve the problem uh, on the ground that those um, agencies deal with, but nobody feels they can challenge it, um, and you know, services feel, feel they can't challenge it because if you do question it, you're portrayed as somebody who, who doesn't care about um, victims of domestic abuse. And also, the fact that we're talking about domestic abuse is itself a shift. We used to talk about domestic violence, and I've been in meetings where people are correcting themselves for using the old term because they feel so inhibited about having a conversation. About the training, about the coercing and controlling behaviour, uh, it's shockingly limited. Um, as with all police training, there is so much to learn, and we deal with such a variety of stuff. You'd be surprised how little input we get on a specific issue, so it's really difficult. Take the point about, I mean, the coercive control, no, I really don't think it's particularly useful. That's the point. It does happen, but how can it, it's very hard to identify it. 
the question about demonising men and the football supporters and all these, it's all part of the same picture for me. It's politically expedient, that's the point. So you get people like in Scotland, we had Kenny McCaskill, and with a lot of people, like women, Scottish Women's Aid, for example, other groups behind him, to stand up and it were, it, it's all about manipulation using gender stereotypes, basically. He's the strong man protecting the weak women, um, and there you get, it, he looks good. And this is what's happening all over the place, I think. And then you get laws which are based on uh, very, very poor level of evidence or efficacy, basically. Voice of control, um, as I said you know, in the introduction, I actually don't think in reality it's made much difference. Um, even though, uh, I mean, even the, the police officer here, we, we work very closely with the police. Uh, I'm saddened to hear what Cassia says about how, how the police officers feel, but I, I can see they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. We're in a risk-averse world and they have to do and dance to the tune of politicians. Um, I'm just in the business of supporting people who come to us for help and I wish to God the politicians would sort this out because it's a nightmare to try and get funding for it as well. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so on, on the subject of the coercive and controlling behaviour law. Um, so yeah, I think it's very subjective, it's open to abuse. Um, and the fact that already men are being like jailed and, and for, for really trigger um, reasons. Um, it just, it, oh, it's gonna get worse. And um, as Nick said, this law is, in, in terms of you know practicality, it will be difficult to enforce it. It's more like in virtue signaling, you know, symbolic though really, just to say the politicians are on the right side, they're the progressive ones. Great, okay, thank you, I enjoyed that. <laughs>